15 seconds. I'm going to turn your mic on for you in 5 seconds. Welcome to the WMNF Afternoon Call-In Show, The Last Call. I'm Sean Canan. Later in the show, we're going to open up the phone lines to take your calls. My guests today are Cindy and Craig Corey. In March 2003, their daughter, Rachel Corey, was killed in the Gaza Strip when she was run over by a Caterpillar bulldozer being driven by a member of the military, the Israeli military. They're in Tampa this week to attend the United Methodist Church General Conference. They're part of a group hoping the church will divest from Caterpillar and two other companies supplying the Israeli occupation. You can find our stories about this issue on our website, wmnf.org news. We'll talk about the divestment campaign in just a moment, but first I want to say, welcome Cindy and Craig. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thanks so much for joining us. And first, can you begin by telling us what was Rachel doing in the Gaza Strip in 2003? Rachel, uh, after 9-11 in this country really, uh, became very curious about why that had happened here. And she was a college student at the time, and that led her to the issue of Israel and Palestine as being a, a core uh, problem uh, and a core reason for why we had suffered the attack we did here. Uh, she. Uh, spent a lot of time studying with her uh, classmates and also with people. She became connected in our community of Olympia, Washington, uh, with people who had direct connections to Israel and Palestine. And she really began her own personal inquiry about the whole thing. And uh, in 2002, as a student, some of her friends traveled to the Middle East with something called the International Solidarity Movement. It was a, a movement of internationals and Israelis and Palestinians. It was a Palestinian-led movement. Um, started when there was a resolution in the United Nations to bring on a human rights monitoring force to the region. And that resolution, introduced by the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Mary Robinson, was vetoed by Israel and by the United States. And at that point, the organization ISM was founded. Some of Rachel's friends went. She followed their work. And then after they'd come back, uh, she learned that Gaza was a place where maybe the need was greatest. And she did a lot of preparation. She studied Arabic. Uh, she made her plans and so forth and learned as much as she could. Also brought her parents into the picture, you know, trying to share with us what she intended and was thinking about doing. And then in um, January of 2003, she traveled uh, to uh, the West Bank for training with ISM and then directly to Gaza uh, to support Palestinians who at that time uh, were in, in Rafah, in the southern part of Gaza particularly, were under great threat. There were um, massive uh, home demolitions happening at the time. It was during the Second Intifada. It was a very difficult time for all people in the region at that point. Um, but there, was, there were these clearing, massive clearing demolitions happening. So part of what she was doing was to work with other international activists to try to um, be there in solidarity with the Palestinians whose homes were threatened because of their location on the border with Egypt, not with Israel, but on the border with Egypt where a wall was being built and uh, land was being cleared and uh, that was a piece of their work. It was also to work with women and children and to build connections with our community, but that was an important piece. And then in March of 2003, Rachel was guarding a, a home that was about to be demolished. I believe it was of a, of a, um, uh, and a doctor in his family, is that, is that true? Um, and there's, and this is foreshadowing a little bit of what we're going to talk about later, but there was a caterpillar also involved that day. Uh, what's, what's the story of the day that she was killed? Well, she was. Uh, it was the home of two Palestinians. So one was a pharmacist, but they do a lot of doctoring there. And one was an accountant, so just middle class folks. Uh, and uh, they, so two families living in upstairs, downstairs. Uh, uh, house and duplex, and they had five children at the time, and the child, the four adults and five children were behind the wall that Rachel was in front of, and she actually knew these people. She uh, slept in the floor, actually, with the children in the uh, in the parents' bedroom because as the Israeli military would drive 
in front of their house. And this had been a neighborhood. They built in the center of town, but all the houses between them and the border had previously been destroyed. So they drive through there and they shoot. Cindy and I uh, were in that house. It was still standing when we went uh, to Gaza in the fall of 2009 in September, or excuse me, in, in fall of 2003. And uh, you could see the bullet holes coming through the children's bedroom wall inside the bedroom. They, and this is concrete walls. They go through the concrete wall between the bedroom and the living room, but they couldn't get, they didn't get through this third concrete wall. So the whole family slept in this back bedroom. And since, Rachel talked about that in, uh, and wrote about it and talked about waking up in a big puddle of blankets with the children on the floor. So she knew these children. She knew they were behind the wall. And this bulldozers that had been sort of mucking around in the area all day and coming right up to uh, the protesters who would stand the ground and, and try not to let them destroy structures. Well, one of them headed straight towards this house, and uh, like they've been doing earlier in the day, and the bulldozers would come right up next to them, because it sounds a little bit uh, difficult to stand in front of bulldozers, but they would. They'd come right up next to them and then stop. Now, one person was rolled over into some concertina wire, wire, and Alice was pushed once up against the house, but when people yelled, the bulldozers stopped. But in Rachel's case, as it came toward the house where she, she knew the children involved, uh, it didn't stop this time, and it just drove over her, crushing her, and and then pulled back. Uh, her friends, the eyewitnesses, said it did not lift its blade when it came back. And she was actually uh, still alive uh, when her friends got to her. She said uh, her last words were, I think my back is broken, and, uh, and, and but she died in Alice's arms uh, there. And that was a, a Caterpillar machine? It was a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. We're not talking about small cats here. We're talking about a 60, when it's armored, and they're armored, so you can't shoot into them or whatever. Uh, it's 65 tons once it's fully armored. They're huge, about two and a half story high uh, mammoth machines. Uh, and, uh, and they're used in, you know, you don't need that sort of armor if you're going to use this bulldozer in your own neighborhood. That they're used to destroy houses to um, to make way for tanks to go in. They're actually stronger than the tanks and, and more armored than the tanks and armored personnel carrier, and, and they're incredibly destructive. An American college student was killed in a foreign land by someone in a foreign military. What was the response of the American government at the time? We've had support along the way, and we're still working with the U.S. government. Um, our congressman, Rachel's congressman at the time, he wasn't ours at the time, Brian Baird, um, very shortly after she was killed, uh, issued a, or uh, submitted a resolution in the U.S. Congress, HCR 111, that called for a U.S. investigation into Rachel's killing, uh, called for uh, condolences to our family, and to um, have the Israeli and U.S. governments work together to make sure nothing like this ever happened again. Um, that We worked very hard, and people across the country worked very hard with us uh, to get support for that resolution. It, it died in committee, in a um, subcommittee of the House, uh, it was the House International Relations Committee at the time. And, uh, but we had more support for that resolution than for most others that had anything to do with Israel and Palestine. Our congressman was actually shocked, and it was because people across the country mobilized to take this um, question to their members of Congress. We couldn't have gotten near the support without the help that we had from everyone. Um, but that resolution died in Congress. Um, we, our family, um, visited at that time a every congressional office uh, to try to encourage investigation, further investigation into Rachel's case. We've worked with the State Department. We've had contact with the White House during the Obama administration, actually. Uh, but the position of the U.S. government in a letter that was written to us in 2004 is um, that after reading a report, there was a, there was a military police investigation done in Rachel's case. And that's rare. Uh, what happens with Palestinians who are harmed, and we have to keep in mind that there were thousands of Palestinians that were killed during this period as well. Uh, their cases were rarely investigated to the extent that Rachel's was. But we did have a military police investigation, but it found no fault, absolutely no fault at all. The case was dismissed, and the uh, Israeli government refused to release a report to the U.S. government. 
some people in the embassy and a couple of people at the state were allowed to read it. Our family eventually was allowed to read the report. Um, but after that, the, the official position from the State Department uh, it, that we have in writing is that the, um, what they read did not represent an investigation that was thorough, credible, and transparent. Um, at that point, um, we were actually encouraged by State Department officials to pursue this in Israeli courts, which we have done. And we are actually right now, this is nine years later, uh, but we are still in the Israeli courts. We're actually, um, just at the end of this month, the last written piece in this process will be submitted, and we're expecting a verdict sometime this year, but we still don't know when that will be. Uh, so it's been a very, very long process. Um, we feel that the, certainly um, the response of the Israeli government has been very inadequate. The trial itself has been eye-opening to us in terms of what, uh, how inadequate the investigation into Rachel's case was, um, but the trial has been eye-opening in other ways. Um, and, and actually investigations in Israel are very, uh, it's, a, it's a topic that the human rights organizations there address a great deal because they feel there are great problems with it. Um, but as I said, we continue to work with the U.S. government. We do have embassy officials that have been at every court date that we've had. Uh, so while we would like, um, I, I think, a stronger response, all of us would have, um, we appreciate that they're still engaged. That's the voice of Cindy Corey. The mother of Rachel Corey. Also joining us is Craig Corey. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is The Last Call. My name is Sean Canan. And you're in town now because there's a United Methodist Church General Conference in Tampa for this week and next week. And there's there are some people in the United Methodist Church who are trying to get a resolution passed. Tell our listeners about that. Well, it actually rises out of the uh, Palestinian Christians that are living in Palestine, and there are uh, Christians. Of course, that's that's the land where Christianity was invented, as they like to say. So, of course, they're Christians in the West Bank and uh, in Gaza as well, and they've called for support for divesting from some of the countries, uh, companies that are actually profiting for the uh, tragedy that's happening there. So uh, I think one of the lessons Rachel taught us early on is that you have to support the people that are working nonviolently to end this, because if you don't support the nonviolent resistance, who are you supporting? All of us, I think in the United States, all of us personally, if somebody comes and destroys your home, you're going to fight back against that. So it's how you do it, and, and, and I think both tactically, because it's the strongest way to, to resist, it ought to be nonviolently, but I think in terms of your own soul and your own uh, inner peace that nonviolence, uh, you know, we've learned this over the years, that's the way to go. So uh, f for the church, they're asking that the church divest and sell out of three individual companies that the church has over the years asked to cease to support this. So the most obvious one for our family, because our daughter was run over by this huge Caterpillar bulldozer, is Caterpillar. And uh, the church, as well as our family, we have a lot of it personal experience talking about cat. So uh, it, it's not the case that we would look at the church uh, or the Caterpillar Corporation and say, wait a minute, you sold this stuff and something bad happened, so you're responsible. It's the fact that having sold it in the past and bad things, that, for instance, just take our situation. Rachel was killed, crushed to death by this bulldozer. And we've talked to Caterpillar about that, so I can say they know about that. And then I go back in 19, or excuse me, in 2009, and I look at a little child. He's crawling out of a bunch of rubble. He's around a bunch of rubble, and he explains to me that in January of 2009, when Israel attacked, a bunch of bulldozers came around his house, and there were soldiers outside. They felt they couldn't go out or they'd be shot. The bulldozers started, or the military started destroying their house. The family ran down and down the stairs. They got into the basement. The house, and these are concrete houses, was destroyed on top of the family, but the basement held. And so they could dig themselves out. You know, what I'm saying is, okay, why at that time was Caterpillar supporting the parts selling what they are now selling more uh, bulldozers to Israel when that's what they're doing and the bottom line to a church however you look at this is I, to me you can't be human and profit from that sort of misery to other people you just certainly can't be a Christian church and do that so let's really ask of the church 
I think, is in a sense, live up to its own soul. They've already come out against the occupation. They have taken political stance on that. It's, so this is a, a question of just being consistent with that. But also, it's just really simple. You can't do this, guys. And, and of course, the result of that, you know, you can't get profits from this. But the result of that is going to be a political of fall because it is a political question when you start watching that. But I also think that mainstream churches are in a position to do this work and do it with the courage and the commitment and uh, the love that it takes to do the least damage in all of this and, and, uh, and help the country and Israel and all these relations heal as quickly as possible. So I think there's a real opportunity here, and I hope that this, the church goes forward with this. The church is really trying to uh, align its actions with its words. As Craig pointed out, they've passed resolutions in 1996 and again in 2004 opposing the occupation. I understand that for over the past 40 years, um, the bishop there was a bishop's committee that sent forward a, a resolution opposing the occupation many, many years ago. And so now this what this resolution calls for is for the United Methodist uh, General Conference to say, now uh, we've tried to engage with the, with Caterpillar, with Hewlett Packard, with Motorola. We have worked with them for many, many years. And I'll just add that it's not just the Methodists who have done this, but other church denominations and thousands of others. We've been we have people. We've we've Craig and I actually tried to meet with the um, president of Caterpillar in I believe it was 2004. I've forgotten the year now. We wrote a letter. Uh, we got a response b back saying they didn't need to meet with us because they understood our position just by reading the letter and so uh, and and many many others have been communicating with them with Hewlett Packard with Motorola these corporations know what's happening and they they know that we feel they need to take a moral stance and this group of, of Methodists that we're supporting believes that the uh, Methodist Church needs to put actions behind their words there's a pair of competing editorials in this morning's Tampa Bay Times. One is one takes the side of the solution it could include divestment from companies, and the other says the title is "Build Up, Don't Punish." And one of the points they make is that um, that Israel or the, the building up the weaker side, in this case they're referring to Palestinians, not tearing down the stronger one, in, in this case they're referring to Israel, would be the way to go rather than divestment. How would you respond to that? Well, remember we're talking about war machinery here, so if, if what they're suggesting is that we give F-16s to the Palestinians, I'm against it, <laughs> you know, I think, and I think most people would. Uh, one example of investment that the U.S. did make, for instance, in the Gaza Strip, is that the U.S. paid to uh, build their electrical generation plant. And then uh, the U.S. insured, a U.S. company insured that electrical generation plant. And then U.S. bombs were used to destroy half of that electrical generation plant. You know, are we a great country or what? We can do all three of those things. Uh, that yeah, doesn't do it. When you say U.S. bombs, you're talking about bombs that were made in the U.S. and sold to Israel. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for making that clear. But, uh, you know, that doesn't work if you don't have the political apparatus and the, and the freedom on the ground. The, the first thing that uh, the investment that particularly the Palestinians need from us is to, is to open up the area and, and make it so that they can travel freely, uh, so that they can get at, so that they have export. For instance, in, in Gaza, and, and actually, uh, this is coming actually out of the White House and somebody we talked to there. He says, you know, they have the siege of Gaza is a failed policy. Now they haven't changed it, but that's what he said. And he said, when I, I say that, I don't mean that they have to have more food in there. He said, I mean that they have to have a viable economy. That means they have to be able to export as well as import. That means that their students need to be able to get out to school, that business people need to be able to come in, that they have to have the raw re the resources, uh, you know, so they have to have water. And actually, when he said that to us, Cindy said, well, wait a minute, that's our list. Mm. But you know that was said to us, I think, about uh, a year and a half ago, and there's been there has been some change in Gaza, but but not nearly enough. They do not, you know, they get a few exports out, but but it's just a trickle. So those are the things they need. 
I think that um, certainly supporting Palestinian development and economic development and all kinds of de development is important. And there are many people that really are working on that kind of thing now. Uh, but it's very difficult for a society to develop when they're living under the circumstances that the Palestinian people are in, in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in East Jerusalem. And uh, so I would say that the, that, that, that investment, that kind of investment, yes, it should happen, but it, it can't substitute for making the, the changes and finding the solutions that will end this um, occupation, will uh, provide security and freedom and equality for all of the people that live in the region. And what we've seen, uh, I think what the Methodists have experienced and what many of the rest of us have seen on the ground. Craig and I, I have been in Gaza four times. We've been in the West Bank many times. We've been in Israel for seven months out of the past two years because of the trial. We have many friends in all of those places that we care deeply about. And what, my, what we see is the situation on the ground uh, becomes worse and worse. The settlements are expanding. There, there are now over 500,000 settlers in land that is Palestinian land. Uh, when you go in and you see uh, the, the settlement development, and uh, one of the speakers at the, at the conference this week is a Palestinian farmer, Daoud Nasser. We've been to his farm. His family's struggling to hold on to their land. They've been, they have papers for it that date to the Ottoman Empire. They ha are in in the courts, in the uh, Israeli courts now, have been for 20 years. Uh, they've just gotten new demo new orders not to be able to cultivate and to demolish. And uh, you know, it, it's it's when you go there and you see the settlements that are circling that one farm. It's just amazing to me that this family's been able to even sustain the energy to carry this on for uh, the length of time. It's a, it's an amazing story, and to do it so peacefully, which they have done. So I I just um, I think, yes, let's invest, but we've all been working at this a very long time, and the governments in this, in this situation have really failed the people. And I see our own government um, because of a very one lopsided um, support of the Israeli government and the Israeli position has really um, made it difficult for there to be real progress here. So uh, we've seen divestment work in South Africa. And in other places, uh, we have calls from people like Desmond Tutu uh, to support initiatives like this. We th I think the Methodists can make a huge difference here. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about the conference in just a second, but I want to give out the telephone number in case people want to join this conversation. If you'd like to speak with Cindy or Craig Corey, you can call 813-239-9663. Uh, 813-239-9663. So at this conference, they're, they're uh, talking about it in committee right now, and if that clears the committee, it could go to a floor vote of all the delegates. What's that process like? You know, uh, Craig, and, uh, Craig grew up in the Methodist Church, uh, but we're, I'm not a Methodist, uh, so we're learning as we're here, and it's fascinating to watch. And I have to say, um, uniformly, wonderful people here, warm, wonderful people, uh, busy and willing to take time to hear from us, and uh, very welcoming to visitors. But uh, I'm not an expert on the process. There are other people that know it best. But what we've learned so far is that there's likely to be a vote in the financial committee where the um, resolution now lies uh, later this week and that following that um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happens if there's actually a positive vote there uh, if there should be a negative vote and of course we hope that's not the case I think there's still a, a very strong chance that through um, obtaining some signatures that it will go to a full vote of, of this group of Methodists who have come from all over the world to participate in this I believe there's something like 988 people at the convention center. And uh, what was remarkable to me is that about a third of them are international delegates. I think about a quarter come from Africa. Um, we were at an event the first evening. Uh, I just felt so uh, fortunate to be there. Bec uh, the number of countries represented was amazing. And uh, I've had conversations with people from the Congo, from people with people from the Philippines, from Europe, as well as people from all over the U.S. And people, uh, today we had a very moving 
experience. Uh, we, the uh, Kairos, uh, the United Methodist Kairos Response Group, uh, had a luncheon where we uh, anticipated maybe 70 or 75 people would come. We had been talking to people about coming. We uh, actually had standing room only. Over 300 people came to the luncheon, and we, uh, I think some actually had left before they could get food, which we <laughs> were sorry about. Uh, but there, there, the interest was great. Uh, we were very heartened by that. But one gentleman, um, just mentioned how much he wanted to bring this story, these stories to Africa. He wanted his people in Kenya to hear about it, and I've taken his information. We're going to make sure that gets to the right people. But there are wonderful connections being made here. Well, let's take a call from Danny in Tampa. Hi, Danny. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Well, thanks for that call, Danny. Um, we'll go now to this caller. Hi, caller. You're on the air. You're on the air. What's your name and where are you calling from? Yes. Hi, Warren. What's on your mind? Uh, the place where Rachel was, Rafa, was at the southern tip of the Gaza Strip. Um, as I said earlier, it's on the border with Egypt, not with Israel. Uh, of course, at that time, Gaza was occupied internally uh, as well as um, outside of Gaza, but th there were approximately...